Lion King version. And so th these are all just massively, massive generation of remixes about this. The SpongeBob version just goes on and on. Okay, so that's April 2007. August 2007. By August 2007, he's signed by a major label because he's a total phenomenon by this time. And, and when they made the official video through the record label, they sort of made fun of themselves. The record label kind of made fun of themselves because they've been blindsided by this user-generated content becoming bigger than anything they had produced. So they produced this video, and actually you can see it's a total commentary on how it actually emerged through the web and then finally sort of catching up. Just a few more notes about this. Um, you can see it's all about new media. Uh, but this ended up uh, seven weeks at the top of the Billboard Hot 100. Um, not bad for something that started off as user-generated content. It also was nominated for a Grammy Award. Um, <laughs> so here's what's really interesting. is that almost 10,000 videos on YouTube out of the 200,000 are addressed to the YouTube community every day. There are videos like this. Yo, flip right job. What did you do? One, two, one, two, here. So just thinking about why, you know, we can start with, with some studies of uh, the lack, the loss of community over time. So Robert Putnam is famous for this, but a lot of other people have been looking at this as well. Um, and, you know, some of the explanations that are around for this general sense of a loss of community are things like when women join the workforce, there's, there's suddenly less free time. Um, moving from the corner grocery store to these large supermarkets and ultimately these huge big box stores. Uh, there's a number of things that are contributing to this. And so suddenly we're in these, these massive communities of suburbia where we're disconnected and connected only by, by roadways and TVs. And the TVs themselves are isolating. So there's many different analyses of why culture or why community has been in decline. Um, and meanwhile, new forms of networks and communities are emerging. So for example, we now have all these cell phones around, and Barry Wellman has this great uh, comment where he talks about moving from place to place to person to person connectivity, a uh, phenomenon he calls networked individualism. So you think about this state. So <clears throat> that's a really key point about online video is the, the network around it and how it relates to other online video. And for you, that can work in a couple of ways. It could be that people remix what you do. It could be that you remix what other people do. Mm -hmm. It could be that you address other people on YouTube or video communities like Vimeo and VU and Seismic and so on. Um, and I want you to, to think about those possibilities and explore some of those possibilities over the next week and, and weeks following. Um, this guy, M. Vesh, who... who who does this presentation? Um, it's worth looking at his videos generally, because particularly for you, Andy, if, you, if you're doing Moodle, because he does a lot of um, stuff. This, this is the, the famous. All right, so I'm gonna take um, the very famous video that he did. I'm sure you've seen this. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just. Uh, just show you that because this is taking static imagery and making something, um, making moving images from this. Um, so, we've got user control, we've got comments, we've got links, we've got annotation. Um, you can annotate your videos on YouTube, you can add captions, you can add little speech bubbles and links and extra information. There's mashability, remixing. So think about those elements in your own work. Um, just on a final point, um, on a technical level, so we've talked about the actual editorial production of this, but the types of video, the considerations around online video and so on. Um, on the technical level, obviously there are all sorts of choices you can make in terms of the recording and editing of this. You, you've all got flips at the moment. If you want to book those out after this lesson, then um, pay a visit to the tech desk opposite. Um, there are other types of handheld camcorders in the tech office as well. We've got Kodaks, we've got Samsungs. There's obviously mobile phones. Um, 
many digital cameras allow you to do this as well. And then we've got higher end kind of uh, studio level, broadcasting level, recording equipment, camcorders um, as well. Don't forget about your laptops. You can obviously use your webcams, built in webcams on laptops, quite effectively to video and stream material. And uh, yeah, uh, have a seat if you want. Uh, and then there's, there's Skype as well. Skype, but you can use Skype and different uh, kind of related tools to record two way interviews, things like something called Ecamm's Call Recorder, which allows you to record a video conversation. And some people do video podcasts as well, do you interview, just as you would a two way uh, interview on TV. When it comes to editing, you've obviously got iMovie uh, built in on some Macs. Windows Movie Maker is free and comes with most PCs and PC laptops. There are web-based editing suites like Pixorial, Motionbox, JCut, and so on. Screen capture software, uh, Jing is one, there's tons of others which will record what's happening on your screen, which is again quite useful if, if you're doing um, stuff where that's going to be uh, relevant. Another consideration to bear in mind is that you should obviously be optimising this for the web. I've talked in the past about the problems with HD flips and HD video generally is, is the upload time, generally for very little benefit in terms of the end user. The, the you know, high definition doesn't make a great deal of difference online. Um, so you, you'll generally need to optimise it for the web. 512 kilobits is, is pretty, um, is fine for broadband connections. Um, you know, in some situations, you might have people might be accessing it via dial-up, and you might want to do an even lower bandwidth version, a lower quality version. Um, mobile for if you're doing it for mobile forms, that's another consideration. There's a on the bookmarks for this week. There's the flash bitrate calculator um, from Adobe, which is useful for, for calculating how long it will take people to view. So you've edited it. You've um, You've optimised it, you need to publish it. Again, all sorts of considerations. YouTube is, is a pretty, um, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be many examples where you're not going to use YouTube. It's the second biggest search engine in the world. It's bigger than Bing, it's bigger than Yahoo. Um, so it's, it's an enormously important uh, distribution network for your material. But that doesn't necessarily mean people are going to find it. Vimeo has a much more uh, specific community around it, particularly around documentaries, high quality video, so you probably want to put it on there as well if that's the sort of thing that you're producing. Vidler allows you to tag different bits of your video so you can so when someone appears you can tag that, that part, which is useful for search engine optimization and uh, usability. Twelve seconds doesn't exist anymore, um, but there are there are other short form video platforms. Posturus, obviously if you send a video to a Posturus blog, if you email it, it will automatically embed it and create a viewer. So that's quite useful, particularly if you're doing mobile video. So if you film something on your mobile phone, you can email it to Posturus and it will do all the rest for you, the optimization, put, even putting it on YouTube, on your YouTube channel. You can set all that up quite nicely. So Posturus is quite a nice shortcut to getting video from a mobile phone or even from a flip onto the web very quickly. Masher allows other people to do things with you. Then there's live streaming software, which we've covered in the past, Quick, Bambuza, Ustream. Um, there are Twitter-specific ones like Twitcasting, I think it's called, which is great, CamTweet and so on. And then conversational video platforms like VU and Seasonic, all of which are useful in different situations. Um, you know, Seasonic, for example, if you're doing an interview. And then you need to think about distribution. What happen, What can you do with the RSS feed? Do you have an RSS feed? You will do on YouTube, you will do on Vimeo, uh, and most of the other platforms. So do you need to syndicate it to different things? Do you need to cross-publish on Twitter and blogs? You can get a VODPOD widget for your blog, which will embed a um, video from your source. Um, and so on. Uh, you show is quite an, an interesting one in that you can allows you to tweet a video but you can also specify what point of the video it starts playing so it doesn't if you want to, to say look at this video from three minutes in you can 
use you show to link directly to three minutes into that video, not just the start of the video. And there are WordPress plugins, ways to get video on maps like Visual Pin and so on. So there's lots of possibilities around video. Uh, Google Maps allows you to embed videos in, in map points as well. Uh, another one that isn't on here is Dipity. Dipity, you can create a timeline with videos, and again, you can embed videos in that timeline. So there are all kinds, of, there's a huge amount of possibilities around what you can do with a simple video. And it's just worth being aware of all of these possibilities and playing with some of them to come up with creative ideas that, that will be more compelling, perhaps, depending on what your subject matter is and what your community is, than just a three minute video slapped on YouTube. Okay. And that's it really. To sum up all of those points, um, the first question you need to ask yourself is whether video is going to be useful here. You have to bear in mind that it will take longer than other forms like text. So um, is it worth the time that you're going to spend on it? Is it going to give you something that text or audio or maps or other media are not going to give you. Um, you need to have systems set up so that once you do some video, it's out there quickly. Um, so that might include syndication, it might include knowing where to send it to to get it online. Um, it will include practice and experimentation so that when you need to react quickly, you, you're not having to edit yourself, you're not having to learn how things work, you know what to do and you can do it quickly. And obviously just you know, listen to lots of video, watch lots of video and play with lots of different tools um, and just get used to it. Okay. So um, any questions before we move on? Whew.